Hello, everyone. Welcome to our week 10 lecture. This will be on the renal system and the digestive system. This information will show up on the bio biochem portion of the MCAT. Um, I have eight questions that we're going to go over, and then we will discuss the content um, that is associated with these questions. All right, so we have our link to our group me here. If you want to join our group me, you can go to this link. Um, our Instagram handle is here. This is also the link to our YouTube channel. This is where you can find um, our lectures in the MCAT question-based review course and um, our other videos uh, that we release. We also will have two lectures a week. As always, this is week 10. We will continue for 15 weeks. Um, we'll have a Sunday recorded release at 8.30 p.m. and a Monday recorded release at the same time. All right, so our first question here, uh, this is going to be on the renal system. So make sure that you are answering these questions like you would on the MCAT. Make sure that you are evaluating each question before going to the answer choices. This way you won't get distracted by any potential wrong answers. Think of an answer on your own before reading through the choices. Um, so I'll go to the first question, read the question to yourself, pause the video, and we will go over it. All right, so question one states, which of the following are rules of the kidneys in the body? Roman numeral one, maintaining acid-base balance. Roman numeral two, excreting hydrophobic waste and Roman numeral three, protection from exposure to chemical elements or pathogens. So because this is a, a Roman numeral question, I will evaluate the one that appears exactly twice. So I can evaluate Roman numeral two, or I can evaluate Roman numeral three. I will choose to evaluate Roman numeral two, which states excreting hydrophobic waste. I know this is a role of the kidney, um, so I can cross out A and I can cross out C as those do not have Roman numeral two. Um, then I can evaluate one or three. I will choose to do one here, uh, which states maintaining acid base balance. I know that this is a function of the kidney. So therefore I know my answer here is B. Um, and then I will not need to do this on the MCAT, but I will do this for explanation purposes here. Um, three states protection from exposure to chemical elements or pathogens. Um, and I know that is wrong. That is a function of the skin. Um, so answer here is B. Um, in the next slides, we'll go over um, other function, uh, the other function of the renal system. Um, so the roles of the kidneys, um, we it has uh, excretory and homeostatic roles. Um, excret excretory roles deals with the disposal disposal of waste products. And homeostasis deals with the um, deals with keeping um, physiological substances constant. Um, so we went over one and two here: excretion, excretion of hydrophilic waste, and maintenance of constant solute concentration and constant pH. We also the kidneys also um, maintain constant fluid volume, and this is accomplished by uh, filtration, selective reabsorption, and secretion. So what this means is that um, first off, blood uh, gets filtered into the kidney, much like a coffee filter does. Um, so at this point, blood in the kidney is present um, after filtration. Uh, blood is present in the kidney, um, in the renal tubule to be exact, and uh, it's now called the filtrate. It will eventually become urine, but it first has to go through the process of selective reabsorption. So um, some substances that the body still does need will want to gain that back by reabsorbing certain substances. Um, so this occurs as the filtrate moves through the tubule. Um, and then we have secretion. So this will add substances back to the filtrate um, that the body wants to get rid of. And that is what will become urine. So the structure of the kidney, um, we have our outer region here, which is the cortex, um, and then our inner region here, which is the medulla. We also have our renal pyramids here, which are essentially the collecting ducts of the nephrons. So collecting duct is a part of the nephron. 
Um, we'll talk about that later on. But our nephron is the functional unit of the kidney. Um, and we have about over a million um, in each human kidney. So when urine then leaves the nephron, it hits the renal papilla. That then um, will will then hit the uh, renal calyx here. Uh, and then that'll converge at the renal pelvis here. We'll end up going down the ureter and then into the bladder. Um, and that will be urine in the bladder. All right, so we have our uh, second question here. Um, so I will go to the question, read the question to yourself and pause the video. So our second question states, um, amino acid reabsorption in the nephron occurs in the... So if I didn't know this answer, um, I would first look through each one. Um, I know that reab selective reabsorption happens in the proximal convoluted tubule and distal convoluted tubule. So I can cross off B, I can cross off D. Um, so it's either proximal or distal convoluted tubule. tubule. I also know that about 70% of substances are reabsorbed that are going to be eventually um, reabsorbed by the nephron happens in the proximal convoluted tubule. So a good guess would be A. Um, however, that is actually right too, because certain ions uh, get absorbed here like potassium, um, sodium, uh, bicarbonate, and then also glucose does, amino acids do. Um, basically, anything that gets into the filtrate that the body does want back. So our answer here is A. So now we're looking more into a little bit more detail here. Uh, looking at the kidney, we're zooming in on a cross section here of the kidney um, and we can see the nephron. So we can see what this functional portion is. Again, we see the cortex, we see the medulla um, and the renal period uh, pyramid. If we zoom in even more, we see the actual nephron itself. Um, and then this here is a, just a zoomed in portion of the proximal convoluted tubule, Bowman's capsule, and the glomerulus. So that is this part right here. Um, so I will go through uh, the pathway that the filtrate does take um, from the uh, renal artery all the way down to the collecting duct. Um, so it'll be a good idea here to follow along uh, with this diagram. Um, you might want to uh, play this part over a few times again as well. Um, so here we have the afferent tubule that is going to uh, bring the blood into Bowman's capsule. Um, when the arterial here um, are in the Bowman's capsule, this is called the glomerulus. Um, and at the glomerulus, there is the glomerular capillary pressure that pushes the blood out into Bowman's capsule. And then the pressures that go the other way is going to be the capsular hydrostatic pressure. Um, and also the colloid osmotic pressure. Um, so that's pushing it back into the filtrate or back into the um, glomerulus. Um, so essentially, if the uh, glomerular capillary pressure is higher, then it's going to push the filtrate into um, the proximal convoluted tubule here. Um, so as we talked about also um, at the proximal convoluted tubule, this is where 70% uh, of reabsorption happens um, as most things get reabsorbed, um, except large molecules that cannot actually even pass through into the filtrate. Um, we have, we talked about glucose and amino acid that gets absorbed. This gets absorbed by secondary active transport um, while water ions, um, just gets absorbed selectively through diffusion. Um, and water is always associated with this movement of ions. They will both move together. Um, and then the blood here that doesn't get reabsorbed um, or the filtrate, I should say, that doesn't get reabsorbed back into the blood um, will then move on here. Um, and then it will reach the descending loop of Henle. 
Um, so this is um, permeable to water, but it is not permeable to ions. Um, so as the filtrate continues to move down, um, water is going to move into the interstitium of the kidney. Um, it will then move into the thin part of the ascending tubule. And so this is opposite. This thin part of the ascending tubule is uh, permeable to ions, but not water. Um, so in this part, um, ions are going to move passively out into the interstitium. Once it hits the thick part of the ascending uh, loop of Henle, it's going to be um, actively, ions are going to be actively removed into the interstitium. Um, and so salt is actively transported out um, and it's very concentrated with salts. Um, the loop of Henle itself can get pretty confusing, um, but if you understand that part, that is pretty much what you'll see on the MCAT. The only other thing is knowing that this is also a countercurrent multiplier system um, due to the filtrate in the ascending limb and the filtrate in the descending limb moving in opposite directions. So the filtrate's moving down here and it's moving up here. This creates a, um, so the ions that are absorbed into um, the ascending limb is going to drive water and that multiplies the amount that, begin, that can be secre secreted, sorry, into the interstitium um, from the descending limb. Um, also, uh, the vasorecta, uh, that is also a component of this countercurrent multiplier system. Um, so that's moving blood in the opposite direction. This causes the filtrate to be constantly exposed to hypertonic, so um, more salty blood, essentially, um, as a result of the blood flowing in opposite directions. And next here, we're going to move into the distal convoluted tubule. So just as the proximal convoluted tu tubule, um, we're going to have uh, selective reabsorption here. Um, but this is also where secretion takes place. Um, and this is affected by hormones like ADH and aldosterone, which we will talk about later on. Um, and then once we move here into the collecting duct and goes go down, this is where our urine just becomes uh, more uh, concentrated. Um, we have the secretion of ions like potassium. We have secretion of ions like hydrogen ions. Um, and then that will eventually move um, as we said out here, uh, eventually into the renal pelvis and then the ureter. All right, so this uh, chart is a pretty good way to see the overview of the functions of the different part of the nephrons. Um, and we can also see where they exist in the kidney, whether they're in the cortex, uh, the outer medulla, or the inner medulla. Um, our inner medulla is the saltiest part, um, the ones with the most ions. So if you know that, for example, um, like the inner medulla has a high osmolarity, drives water reabsorption by osmosis, um, it makes sense that the this part of the loop of Henle is here. Um, and whereas you have the proximal convoluted tubule and the distal convoluted tubule in the cortex, um, this will just, understanding a diagram like this, um, is one to um, look back at um, as it is important to, um, it also would help understand the functions as well. All right, so we have our uh, third question here, uh, the endocrine, we'll talk about endocrine function of the kidneys. Uh, so all the hormones involved, involved essentially. So our third question here, Read to yourself, pause the video. All right, uh, so question three states, which of the following statements is false? So we have A, aldosterone um, increases uh, sodium ion reabsorption in the nephrons. Um, I know that is true. Um, B, ADH increases water reabsorption in the nephrons. I also know this is true. Uh, C, ANP increases blood pressure by dilating the afferent arterial. So this is not true. So ANP will actually decrease blood pressure by dilating the afferent arterial. 
Um, so I know C here is my answer, uh, but also here, if I look at D, angiotensin II uh, also increases blood pressure by vasoconstriction. Um, so I've confirmed my answer here, C. Um, and if you didn't understand um, a couple of these, that's okay. We'll go over the um, important hormones that you do need to know uh, in terms of uh, kidney function. All right. Um, so we'll talk about ADH and aldosterone a little bit uh, more in depth here. So ADH is antidiuretic hormone or vasopressin. Um, this is released by the posterior pituitary when blood volume is low um, and cellular con concentration is high. So as a result, water is reabsorbed from the collecting duct into the blood um, and then pressure will therefore increase. Um, and blood osmolarity also decreases uh, because we were just adding water. So it is diluting the blood that was there before. Um, and this occurs during dehydration. Um, so ADH works by increasing the amount of aquaporins in the cells. So that is how the uh, water is going to move uh, between the blood and between the nephron. And so aldosterone, uh, this is released by the adrenal cortex when blood volume and blood pressure is low. Um, so this also occurs during dehydration. Um, and then as a, as a result, sodium ions um, are reabsorbed in the distal convoluted tubule, as well as the collecting duct into the blood, causing water to follow uh, with it. Um, and that will increase blood pressure. Um, it's also important to note that aldosterone does not directly um, affect blood osmolarity. Um, with aldosterone, blood osmolarity will stay constant um, as sodium is moving, as well as um, water is moving with sodium. All right, um, so now going into aldosterone itself uh, in a little bit more detail. Um, so this whole diagram here is basically what is happening um, in order to eventually get aldosterone release when we have a fall of blood pressure. Um, so what will happen is that the juxtaglomerular, juxtaglomerular cells of the uh, distal tubule um, and the macula densa of the um, distal, tubule, distal tubule is going to release renin. Um, so this is an enzyme here that converts angiotensinogen into angiotensin 1. The angiotensin 1 will then travel to the lungs where it is converted by angiotensin converting enzyme or ACE into angiotensin 2. Um, this causes vasoconstriction. Um, angiotensin itself causes vasoconstriction. It also signals um, aldosterone to be released, um, and that causes sodium to be retained. And so other important hormones that you should know are calcitonin. Um, so this is produced by the C cells in the thyroid to remove calcium ions from the blood. Um, it does this by excreting it through urine. It also does it in other ways that does not involve the kidney, such as depositing it in bone and reducing its absorption in the digestive tract. Um, we also have erythropoietin, or also EPO. This is produced by the kidney when blood oxygen concentration is low. Um, EPO travels to the bone marrow, and it stimulates the production of more red blood cells. Uh, parathyroid hormone 2 is basically the opposite of calcitonin. Um, so it's produced in the parathyroid glands um, to increase the amount of calcium in the body. Um, it does this by resorbing it um, or reabsorbing it through the nephrons, resorbing it from bone, um, and then increasing absorption in the digestive tract. Uh, and then last we hear, lastly here, we have atrial uh, natriuretic peptide or ANP. So um, this is released by the cardiac atria in response to high blood pressure. Um, so when there is a high blood pressure in the heart, um, in the atrium to be specific. Um, this dilates the afferent arterial, leading to increased urine output, um, also decreased sodium reabsorption in the collecting duct.
All right, so question four. Um, so in the renal system, this is specifically going to be about control of pH um, and control of blood pressure. All right, so I'll give everyone a minute uh, to answer the question. So you can pause the video now. All right, so question four here states, if the pH in a patient's blood is low, which substance will be excreted in larger quantities in the urine? Um, so I'll go through and I'll just evaluate them one by one. Um, so A, urea. I know that this is wrong because this would not affect um, how much, um, if more urea or less urea is excreted, uh, this wouldn't affect uh, pH at all. Um, albumin, um, this is also wrong because this is a very large protein that won't be present in the filtrate at all either. Um, if it is, then there is something wrong uh, with the kidneys and the filtration system. Um, bicarbonate, C, um, this is a base. So this would um, make the blood um, less acidic. Um, so we will want this to be retained. Um, therefore, we know D uh, is our answer here. Hydrogen ions being excreted would increase the pH. Uh, so this is favorable. All right. So um, the regulate, we'll talk about uh, regulation of pH in the kidneys. Um, so this is controlled by excreting bicarbonate um, when plasma pH is too high and when it is too low, H plus is excreted uh, pretty much like we saw in the previous question here. Um, and this interconversion is controlled by carbonic anhydrase, which can be found in the epithelial cells of the kidneys. Um, and then we know that uh, bicarbonate um, exists in the bloodstream um, connected to red blood cells. Um, this diagram here, might be a little bit confusing, but if you understood what we talked about, basically that bicarbonate and hydrogen ions um, can control the pH in the body um, and in the kidneys. Um, it's also important to know that this is a slow process. So the body controls other methods um, if it needs to be faster, if we need a faster acid-base balance, but uh, this is one way to do it that might take a few days. Um, yeah, and so this diagram here might be a little bit confusing, but it could also help if you do um, not understand it, um, basically just showing the equation here instead of like this, it's kind of in a square. Um, also, uh, glomerular filtration rate. Um, so this is how fast filtrate moves through the nephron. And uh, this is directly proportional to pressure. We talked about this briefly earlier when we talked about the glomerular uh, capillary pressure, the capsular hydrostatic pressure, and the colloid um, osmotic pressure. Um, so basically the glomerular uh, capillary pressure is the pressure that is going to push the blood out of the glomerulus into Bowman's capsule. So if this is larger or if the other pressure is lower, then the uh, glomerular filtration rate will be higher. So uh, glomerular filtration rate or GFR is going to increase with decreased ADH and aldosterone, increased ANP, increased blood volume and pressure. Um, if the afferent arterial is dilated um, and then with constriction of the efferent arterial. And I would recommend kind of evaluating those and figuring out why uh, those make sense. All right, so we will move on here to the digestive system. Um, we will first talk about the, essentially the uh, oral cavity, the pharynx and the esophagus in the first question. So again, pause the video and read the question to yourself. All right, so our fifth question here states, which of the following macromolecules can be absorbed in the mouth? Um, so if I'm just going through and I'm evaluating them, 
um, I know that A, B, and C are wrong as um, no mac macromolecules are actually absorbed in the mouth. Um, so here my answer is D. Um, fats and sugars begin to be broken down in the mouth, uh, but proteins are only broken down mechanically. Um, so fats and sugars are broken down chemically a little bit, um, but proteins are not at all. Um, carbs are mostly absorbed um, in the small intestine um, when they are, and they have to be broken down into monosaccharides. Um, and then fats are absorbed mostly in the small intestine as well, once mixed with um, bile um, in order to form micelles. Um, so now I'll talk a little bit about the oral cavity. Um, so here is where teeth break down food mechanically by mastication. Um, saliva then begins to break down food chemically with the enzymes lipase, which breaks down fats, and salivary amylase, which breaks down carbohydrates or sugars. And then the tongue forms food into a bolus, which is basically just a mixture of uh, saliva and the food. Um, so that will then travel to the uh, pharynx, um, which is essentially the throat. The hypopharynx is home to the epiglottis, which prevents food from entering the larynx. Um, so that will cl close over to make sure when we, were, we are swallowing, that is going into the esophagus, which then ends up in the stomach. Um, so what the esophagus is, uh, this is the muscular tube that brings through food from the pharynx to the stomach. Um, the upper esophagus is made up of skeletal muscle. The middle esophagus is made up of both skeletal muscle and smooth muscle. And our lower esophagus is made up of just smooth muscle. Um, so our upper, upper esophageal sphincter regulates the movement of food towards the stomach, while the lower esophageal sphincter uh, prevents reflux from uh, the stomach contents into the esophagus. All right, uh, so quest question six, we will be talking about the stomach further. All right, so again, pause the video, read it to yourself and evaluate the questions. All right, so the question states, which of the following associations between uh, the cell uh, and the substance it secretes in the stomach is incorrect. Um, so here we have A and B. I know this is a correct because the chief cells secrete pepsinogen, G cells secrete gastrin. Um, for C here, this is wrong because the uh, mucus cells secrete bicarbonate, um, parietal cells, increase intrinsic factor, they also um, increase HCL. Um, so here I know C is wrong. And if you did not get that, we will talk about more about these associations in the next slides. Okay, so talking about the um, enzymes in the stomach specifically, um, and the cells and the glands that they are released from. So when looking at the gastric glands, we have pepsinogen, which is produced by the chief cells. Um, and this is made active into pepsin um, from the HCL that is secreted by the parietal cells. Um, the parietal cells also secrete intrinsic factor. This aids in the absorption of vitamin B12. Mucus cells, these produce bicarbonate, um, and they protect the internal stomach wall from the acidic environment of the stomach as the stomach sits with the pH around uh, two or three. Um, and then the cells of the pyloric glands, which are other glands that are present in the stomach. We have G cells that secrete gastrin. And this is a peptide hormone that stimulates the parietal cells to produce HCL. Um, this also causes stomach contractions in order to mix the, mix the boluses of food um, and gastric juices together. All right, 
our seventh question here. Um, we will talk about the um, intestines. So I'll move on to the next question here. All right, so the question here states, what is the hormone that stimulates the release of bile from the gallbladder to the duodenum? Um, so first here I can um, cross out B uh, because I know gastric acts in the stomach. Um, D can also be crossed off because um, zymogens are just inactive forms of enzymes. Um, and so between A and C, um, I know A is right because CCK stimulates the release of bile while uh, secretin slows motility, um, controls pH, uh, and then also releases pancreatic enzymes into the duodenum. So my answer here is A. All right, so the uh, talking a little bit about the um, small intestine. So the uh, duodenum is the portion of the small intestine uh, it's the first portion of the small intestine. This is where the majority of chemical digestion takes place. So once chyme, which is now the um, when the bolus was mixed, um, it leaves the stomach as chyme, um, enters the duodenum, um, and this rubs up against the um, brush border, uh, releases brush border enzymes. Um, the types of brush border enzymes that we have, we have disaccharidases, these are specific uh, to certain uh, disaccharides like sucrose, uh, and that will be digested into monosaccharides that can then be absorbed into the later part of the um, small intestine. We also have uh, peptidases. Uh, they break down proteins into mono, di, and tripeptides, which can then be absorbed. Uh, we also have entero enteropeptidase, which is sometimes also called enterokinase, you might see it that way. Um, this activates trypsin, which is uh, from trypsinogen, so that is a zymogen, um, and that is going to activate other zymogens like uh, chymotrypsinogen uh, to form chymotrypsin. It also activates um, enzymes like uh, procarboxypeptidases A and B. So secretin, uh, we talked about that in the last question. This is a peptide hormone that releases bicarbonate, also slows motility. Um, cholecystokinin uh, or CCK, this is a peptide hormone that stimulates the release of pancreatic juices into the duodenum. Um, and then the other parts of the small intestine, we have the jejunum and then we have the ileum. Um, and this is where uh, the primary locations for absorption happen. Um, they have villi and microvilli. Um, these increase the surface area for absorption. Um, so fats, for example, will, um, when they're going to be absorbed, um, they are going to travel into lacteals that will then bring the fats into the lymphatic system. This will also help happen for fat soluble vitamins. Um, for sugars, on the other hand, um, they will be absorbed in the villi or microvilli straight into the bloodstream. Eventually, fats through the lymphatic system will get uh, released into the bloodstream, but they go and travel through the lymphatic system first. Um, we have sugars, we have proteins. These just go directly into the bloodstream, um, either by facilitated diffusion or uh, secondary active transport. All right, uh, so question eight here. All right, so read the question to yourself um, and pause the video. All right, uh, so the question states, which of the following organs does not aid in digestion? So we have A, the liver, B, the gall gallbladder, C, the spleen, or D, pancreas. Um, I know that the liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas all have 
um, functions that do aid in digestion, uh, where the spleen does not um, has the spleen has functions in the uh, immune system and then uh, a few other functions. So answer here is C. So uh, we'll talk about these accessory organs that just showed up in the last question. Firstly, the pancreas. So this is going to secrete pancreatic juices, um, which are produced by um, acinar cells. Um, this is into, um, these pancreatic juices will then go into the duodenum. Um, this is going to aid in digestion. Um, the pancreatic juices are made up of pancreatic amylase. This is going to break down polysaccharides into disaccharides. Um, pancreatic peptidases like trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, and procarboxypeptidase A and B, um, ones that we talked about will eventually, which are zymogens, which will eventually, once they are in the duodenum, then be converted into their active form. And then uh, pancreatic lipases, which is going to break down fats um, to fatty acids and glycerol. So also here we have the liver, which has a function in digestion. Um, it does by producing bile, which is going to be mixed with bilirubin, which is a pigment. Um, and this is released by the liver through bile ducts. It will then go into the gallbladder um, where it will wait. Um, so it'll be stored here um, and it'll also be concentrated until it is needed in the duodenum. Um, and we know that it is needed or the body can sense that it is needed when CCK release causes uh, bile to then flow down the uh, biliary tree, uh, merge with the pancreatic duct, um, and then it's going to be released in the duodenum ultimately. All right, um, and that is it for our lecture tonight. Again, if you need anything, here is my email. Uh, feel free to email me with any questions or reach out in the group me um, if you do have any questions as well. Um, that'd be another way where other students or other tutors can also answer questions. All right, everyone, have a good rest of your night.